You're listening to the N2K Space Network. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. The Tiangong Space Station and the International Space Station are both in low Earth orbit, yes, but they're not only at different heights above the Earth, but crucially, pretty different orbital inclinations. That's why the two space stations don't often appear in the sky at the same time. And if they do, it's for a brief window. But sometimes a lucky station gazer will be able to catch both space stations in the same patch of sky at the same time. And that happened today for a lot of folks in the southern U.S., actually. Kind of a neat convergence. Definitely don't read into it or draw any kind of elaborate half-baked parallels into current international space affairs. No. T-minus. 20 seconds to LOS. T-dress. Go for the floor. Today is December 15th, 2023. I'm Maria Varmazas. I'm Alice Carruth, and this is T-Minus. China launches its space plane. The U.S. House and Senate approve the 2024 military budget. The U.S. White House hosts the Artemis II crew. And our guest today is president of the Association of Commercial Space Professionals, Bryce Kennedy. Stay with us for his insights into workforce development. All right, happy Friday, everybody. Let's take a look at today's Intel briefing. So carrying on that China-U.S. space race, earlier this week, U.S. Chief of Space Operations General B. Chance Saltzman told reporters at the Space Force Association's Space Power Conference it's, quote, probably no coincidence that China's own space plane may launch around the same time as the X-37B. Now, we are still waiting for the U.S. launch on board the Falcon Heavy, But overnight, the Chinese did launch their secretive space plane on board a Long March 2F rocket. Now, we know very little about these secretive unmanned spacecraft. And according to Chinese state media, their spacecraft will operate in orbit for an unannounced period of time before returning to a designated landing site in China. Very illuminating. During its flight, reusable technologies will be verified and space experiments conducted. But no other useful details were released. The details are just as sketchy for the U.S. military's X-37B vehicle, and we're still waiting for a new launch date after it was pushed back due to weather issues earlier this week. And as tensions with China rise, the Pentagon's top space policy official told attendees of the Space Enterprise Council's Global Space Summit in Washington, D.C., that cooperation among allies is critical as global competitors increasingly look to space as the next frontier of warfare. Dr. John F. Plum, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy, said that, quote, the force structures for each of our military services, and I don't mean just the Space Force, are built assuming access to space. For the department, space is in our DNA. It is essential to the U.S. way of war. 
to prevent space competition from escalating to conflict, the US has doubled down on its combined space operations initiative designed to get ahead of the most pressing challenges coming from competitors. And in order to do that, the US military needs funding, which, as we've been reporting on for the last few months, has been an issue as the U.S. budget has been kept at fiscal year 23 levels due to a continuing resolution. There does seem to be some progress, though, as both the House and Senate have voted on the 2024 defense spending bill, but it is still waiting for the president to sign off. The bill supports $841.4 billion in funding for the Defense Department, and of that total, $30.1 billion will go to the U.S. Space Force, which is, we should note, about $79 million below President Biden's request. The bill also limits the use of funds for the U.S. Space Command headquarters until reviews of the selection, which were announced earlier this year, are reviewed. That has been a point of political contention, to say the least, after the Biden administration changed the location after its original selection. I hope we can put that story to bed soon. And speaking of the Biden administration, they upheld a promise to host the Artemis II crew at the White House yesterday. The three Americans and one Canadian crew met with the president and Vice President Kamala Harris. According to NASA, the crew talked about their training and science plans for the mission with the administration. Artemis II is currently set to launch in late 2024. A huge congratulations to Rocket Lab as they not only returned to flight after an explosion in September but they also set a new record for their annual number of launches, surpassing the nine that they set in 2022. This was the 42nd electron rocket launch for Rocket Lab, and it deployed a satellite for Japan-based Earth imaging company, the Institute for Kyushu Pioneers of Space, also known as IQPS. The mission was called, this is so cool, The Moon God Awakens, and launched from Rocket Lab's complex in New Zealand. Named after the Japanese god of the moon, the IQPS SAR-5 satellite Tsukuyomi-1 is a synthetic aperture radar satellite that will collect high-resolution images of Earth. It joins another IQPS satellite already in orbit and forms part of what will eventually be a 36-satellite constellation capable of monitoring Earth at specific fixed points every 10 minutes. A quick update from Sierra Space. They have delivered the first Dream Chaser space plane to NASA's Neil Armstrong test facility in Ohio. The plane, called Tenacity, has entered the final testing phase ahead of its first flight in 2024. Over to the other side of the pond now, and the European Space Agency is facing further setbacks with its launch vehicles. The final flight of Italy's Vega rocket has been delayed after crucial parts went missing, while the latest test of Europe's new Ariane 6 has been aborted. ESA officials say Vega's final liftoff, which had been set for spring 2024, has been delayed to September after two out of four of its large propellant tanks disappeared from a factory in Italy. Huh. As for the larger Ariane 6, the hot-firing test of the upper stage in Germany on December 7th was aborted two minutes into the firing test. ESA officials say that the abort should not affect the inaugural flight of the Ariane 6, which is scheduled for June of next year. Now, Maria spoke to SatView on this show a few weeks ago after their climate monitoring satellite successfully provided its first thermal imaging pictures from space. But unfortunately, the UK firm says that the hot Sat-1 has suffered a failure in orbit. SatView says it does not expect to restore operations, even though the engineers are still in contact with the spacecraft. They say that the satellite was fully insured and a replacement will be flown in 2025. We wish you all the best, SatView. And TELUS Alenia Space has selected the UK's National Satellite Test Facility in Oxfordshire for the first comprehensive assembly, integration, and test campaign of the European Space Agency's FLEX satellite. FLEX, which stands for Fluorescence Explorer, aims to provide a better understanding of the Earth's state of health and vegetation productivity on a global scale. As a prime contractor, TELUS Alenia Space will lead the satellite platform assembly, integration, and test campaign planned in 2025. The European Space Agency, along with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the European Commission's Eurosat and Joint Research Center, and the U.S. Department of Commerce and its Bureau of Economic Analysis, have released statistical classifications for space economy measurements. (sighs) Maria. 
you had some really good thoughts about this earlier. What do you want to say? Yeah, so this is my opinion. Uh, I think we definitely need uh, some better data around all of the impacts of the space economy. And I think part of the reason why many have noticed, and Michael Sheets of CNBC recently said this in one of his newsletters, that space has not expanded well outside of its bubble and hasn't made the impact on the tech world that we kind of would expect that it should, given the humongous numbers we often hear about, you know, the impact of trillions of dollars in development and workforce. I think the reason we haven't seen that is that many of us find that those numbers don't really pass the laugh test, so to speak. And sometimes the numbers do seem to be a bit plucked out of thin air. Uh, to put it politely, they don't seem realistic in some cases. So getting some real numbers and some real stats around the actual impact of the space economy is not to be a, you know, a wet blanket on the, the growing industry, of course. It's to be more realistic. And so when we talk to other tech sectors especially, we can say, here's the actual impact. The numbers are something we can more confidently stand behind. And I think maybe then we'll see a lot more traction outside of sort of the usual space bubble. So I'm encouraged to see something like this, and I'm curious to see where it'll go. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And you'll find the link to that report and further reading on all the stories that we've mentioned in our show notes and at space.n2k.com. And we've also included a piece that we're interested in at T minus GE Aerospace Hypersonic Engine Development. Could it be the breakthrough that the industry needs for point to point space transportation? Let's hope so. Hey, T minus crew. Tune in tomorrow for T minus Deep Space, which is our show for extended interviews, special editions, and deep dives with some of the most influential professionals in the space industry. And tomorrow, we have our full chat with Bryce Kennedy talking about preparing students for entering the space workforce. This was a really fun conversation. I think you all will really enjoy it. So check it out while you're baking Christmas cookies, doing your last minute holiday shopping. I know who you are. Recovering from your holiday work party or maybe just putting your feet up and relaxing. You know, why not? You don't want to miss it. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. A common theme that we keep hearing in the space industry is that we have a workforce problem. And it's not just attracting the right people to pursue careers in space, it's also retaining them that's becoming an issue. And a source of the problem seems to be a disconnect between education and the industry. Are we preparing students for the workforce? Well, we speak to space lawyer and president of the Association of Commercial Space Professionals, Bryce Kennedy, for his insights. So I was brought on as a, an adjunct for an experimental um, class, which was really cool, this last semester at Mexico Tech. And I taught grad uh, students in an engineering program, um, space law and policy, which I, I was surprised. I, wouldn't, I didn't think that I would get any, any bites on it. And we had a, a really substantial class. And one of the things that I was really surprised to see was that all of them were looking, not all of them, but, but a, 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 I'd say a majority of them were looking to have a touch point in the space industry. And yet there wasn't a lot of knowledge about what the space industry was. It was very segmented or very siloed to what the school taught. So here in New Mexico, we have the, the national labs, Los Alamos, Sandia. Um, we also have Air Force Research Labs. And that's kind of where they, they look. And so when I started really teaching a broader skill set of um, what space law and policy was, it was to focus on how they as managers in their fields could start understanding a broader context so that they would be more effective. And, and it was one of those things where I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. It was like water in a desert. 
I was amazed to see the response and the excitement of of people wanting to really understand where they'd be working. And so that got me thinking on a couple of fronts is one workforce development traditionally in space has been very back to my word siloed, um, whether it's in law, whether it's in engineering, you know, because traditionally not all classified, but the commercial industry hasn't really existed that long. And so collaboration hasn't really been needed. And so we have these we have these industries where they just focus on you know we're working on their specific cog and then put it to the greater you know machine um that doesn't work anymore and it is failing quite rapidly um and we're seeing that in a lot of things the other thing that i'm seeing too with especially in in the legal field is that you don't have to be a lawyer to have especially for the regulatory framework, to participate and work with space companies. So a good example is export controls. Export controls touches everything in space. Uh, Well, technically not in space, but everything that goes to space. Um, And you don't need to be a lawyer for that. And, And we've seen a lot of law students come up to us and they're like, boy, I wish I had known that I could have studied export controls or telecom or government contracting and that I would have gotten uh, pretty much a job i don't say in any space company but pretty much any space company because they need those the, the, these things and even beyond law students again you don't have to be a lawyer to do these things and so that's why we're starting to see a shift from traditional academic mindset of this these silo degrees that I, if i'm going to be a lawyer i need to do this or if i'm going to be an engineer i need to do this to a broadening perspective of um of collaboration and um you know, looking kind of outside your scope. Okay, so is it that the employers don't know that they don't necessarily need a lawyer, or is it a bit of gatekeeping in a, in a way? I think that's a really good question. I think I think it's both. I think it's an old mentality. If I go back to the engineers, like all they, job security, who wouldn't want to work for a lab? Who wouldn't want to work for those apples? You know, I mean, as an engineer, it's job security to the max. It's prestige. It's all of these things, but it's a limited number. And so, for example, I brought I brought on a, a, a VC um, from Space Fund, and she was like, she goes, "Look, we look when, to invest into startups. We look for engineers, a strong engineering team, so we know that at least the tech will be completed, you know, within a, a, a level of accuracy." And these students were like. Oh wait, we could go work for. Should we work for a startup? And and she goes, yes, you should be. You should start thinking immediately about working for a startup because a, she goes, you're still young enough that you could still eat ramen for the next two years, and b, you'll get more experience than you would at a lab, and be thrown into the fires and and have to grow faster than any other job out there, and then you can take that and work anywhere you want. And it's like, it's like these type of mindsets, they're just not, they're not translating the way that we're seeing it. And then back to your original question, the primes have always looked at, you know, are you a lawyer? Do you have this? Do you have that? You know, and now we're seeing, especially in the startup world, where it's like, do you have these skills as opposed to do you have this degree? Yeah. I mean, I love education. I love higher education. I'm the daughter of a physics professor. <laughs> like, I get it. But it's, it is it is a huge barrier to clear, especially now when we're talking about school debt in the United States. It's not a small thing at all. But it's also the time commitment on a lot of people's time. Like, do you need four years or more in higher ed when maybe a two-year or less of a certificate program can get you the professional? I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, I wonder, are, are companies set up to understand what they need or they're just going, we need a lawyer? <laughs> Right. Uh, no, I don't think they are. I don't think they are. And, uh, you know, part of our organization at ACSP is like we're we have a huge arm of education. And it's not just educating people on the training. It's educating people on exactly this as well. Like you don't need that. You know, one of the co-founders, Bailey, I, I think she's been on the podcast, too. Um, you just space out where I originally started. The reason she helped and really was the brainchild of ACSP, um, started was like, she was tired of seeing commercial companies fail because they think they needed a lawyer. And while that is good for business as a law firm, her desire to see commerce succeed 
companies succeed, people succeed outweighed, you know, the desire for, for kind of the bottom line of Aegis. And it was like, you don't need a lawyer for this. And we kind of went back to first principles. Okay, so what do you need? And it's like, you just need trained on these basic, on, on some really core things. And the funny thing is, is back to like higher ed, I was talking to, I won't name the college, a university, a very, 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 very prestigious, large university. They're like, we fail at actually providing real world experience that someone can go into an immediate job and, you know, be successful. And, and that's, that's where, that's where we started these trainings, because it's like, we, if, if commerce is, space commerce is going to take off and, and everyone's going to have access to it, we can't continue with just this higher ed positioning. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 this gets into like a meta discussion that I, is a very, uh, for me, a dining room conversation that I have with my family a lot about, you know, the, the, what classical education is meant for in terms of making like a well-rounded, interesting human with a lot of different varied interests. And like, that's great. But sometimes you also need practical training. So, um, you know, getting a classical education is wonderful for making you an interesting person, may not actually train you for the job that you need. Flip side, we've got this great practical need for a lot of jobs that need to be spun up quickly. And, uh, you, know, for sent, you know, for shunting people to programs where they'll read the Iliad, wonderful, highly recommend, but is that going to help <laughs> right. them? You know, is that going to help them? <laughs> And I get it. Like, I've read the Iliad. I love it. But still, like, it's not necessarily Can you give me the, the cliff notes on that? Because I have not yet. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's fine. Go read it on Wikipedia. You get the okay, idea. good. Yeah. Who wins? <laughs> um, the thing, too, is that we're seeing, uh, especially with the workforce, is that a lot of people just don't have the time to do this anymore. I was lucky. I kind of fell into that. You're right. That four years position of being kind of where I am in society of... I could take four years. I could just drink my face off. I could play around with all these other things. But man, a lot of people, you know, a lot of the students that I saw uh, where I taught, they were the first generation to go to school and they're first generation engineers. And so there is no no room for play there. This This is like on multiple levels. They're going to be supporting their families. They're going to be supporting, they're going to be breaking the mold for the first time ever and so that's why this class touched me so deeply because higher ed was not a luxury. It is a necessity. I'm curious your thoughts on, on potential solutions here. I'm going to be going back to, to my university to talk about more of this. They're, they're going to have um, to, to see if this, this class worked, to see if this is something the students want. But a, a solution that I'm going to propose is that, oh, I don't want it. Well, let's come up with a, a fake percentage, but say 50%, 50% of, to me, class or at least the degree should be about getting a job. Like, I don't understand how that is not just baked into the higher ed. Um, but it doesn't make sense to me. Like, when I was bringing in these speakers, I encouraged my students to network them, to create, to find them on LinkedIn, to reach out to them, to ask them questions. And like, oh, that's normal? Can we do that? I was like, you better be doing this. This is the reason I brought these these speakers on, you know, because... Um, so anyway... I, I've seen it in every degree that I've had where that level of job outreach or career, you know, even beyond career fairs, but networking doesn't come, if at all, until the last semester, last month, last whatever. And to me, the, the low hanging fruit is like, start this early, start this as a sophomore if you're an undergrad, start this in your second year if you're grad, you know, for law school, start it immediately with clerkships and internships. This should be, I think, one of the main pushes from from administration to get to get these students jobs immediately. We'll be right back. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCore Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance. 
as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. Welcome back. It's no secret in our office that Alice hates an alien story. It's true. I live in New Mexico, Maria. Enough said, really. I can believe it. Right, so this one isn't quite as sensational as Roswell's spaceship crash, and really it may not have anything to do with aliens. But fast radio bursts were discovered in 2007, and since then, hundreds of these quick, intense events have been detected coming from distant points across the universe. According to clever researchers, the bursts can generate as much energy as the sun creates in one year or more in just a thousandth of a second, and no one has figured out what causes them. So researchers at the SETI Institute's Allen Telescope Array have worked to detect 35 fast radio bursts from one source over a two-month period. And at first, they thought the signal was a repeater, like others found in their research, but a closer look at the signal revealed something new, a noticeable drop in the center frequency of the bursts, acting like a celestial slide whistle. They then converted the signal into sound, using a xylophone, as you do. High notes correspond to the beginning of the bursts, with low notes acting as the concluding tones. It was found that the signal was not a repeat sound, but wholly unpredictable. So I guess their findings have got us all asking more questions about what these fast radio bursts, or FRBs, really are, and what do they mean? It's not aliens. That's it for T-Minus for December the 15th, 2023. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. And we'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at any time, space at n2k.com, or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures that we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like ours are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K's strategic workforce intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth, Mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Jen Iben. Our VP is Brandon Karp. And I'm Maria Varmazis. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend. <laughs> <laughs>